this is a, this is a good day, uh, not because it's particularly happy, but because it is a good day that God has led us to. Today we're going to hear from Pastor Abigail Gaines, who's going to open the word to us. Uh, Pastor Ron Arambaro from Foothill Community Church and his worship team is leading us this morning. And later on in the service, we'll invite you, if you would like, to receive ashes as we begin this Lenten season. We conclude the season of Epiphany, discovery, enlightenment, new insights, the joy of identifying the Christ among us and the Christ within us. And we come to a point where in the face of that joy and that brilliance and that discovery, we realize our own inadequacy. And so we begin a season of Lent in which we commit ourselves to sacrifice, reflection, introspection, confession, because in light of the glory of the epiphany, we see our deficiencies and we mourn. We mourn our deficiencies. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Lord God, we offer you this time now. We ask that you move into the deep recesses of our souls. Invite us into a posture of confession and reflection. May we understand what it is to mourn our inadequacies in light of your glory. Speak to our hearts. Take us by the hand as we begin this season of reflection. In Christ's name, amen. It's very good to be here with you this morning, and I really appreciate the invitation. And and this is sacred space, and I just trust that the Holy Spirit is going to move in our hearts, and as I say to my own church community from time to time, that But the most significant thing this morning is that we could come into connection with the joy of the salvation that Jesus offers us. Amen. My name is Abigail Gaines. Um, I am the lead pastor of a very precious community of believers just down the street called Vineyard Church Glendora. I've been there for 10 years. We actually just celebrated our 10-year anniversary as a church. Um, I am married. I've been married for a little over 20 years. I have four children. I know I want to get the uh, get to know yous out of the way a little bit so you know a little bit about who I am. Um, But I have four children. They range in ages 12 all the way down to our sweet little surprise baby who is just five months old. Yes, so 12, 9, 5, and surprise! It was my 40th birthday present, um, and that is hope. But as I talk to more and more people who have four children, it is often the fourth that is a surprise, so I don't know what that is, but um, she truly is a blessing. And um, this is a full circle moment for me because I was a cougar back in the late 90s. Um, I graduated with a degree in global studies, so there are even some familiar faces here in the room. We've, we've all aged a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not going to say who I think has aged the most. Maybe it's me. <clears throat> But, you know, when I was a cougar back in the late 90s, the biggest dilemma and angst on campus was whether you were in the orange and black camp or the brick and black camp. Was anybody around for that? That was the biggest angst on campus, and it was actually extremely polarizing. Like, there were, it was a totally divided time on APU's campus. I guess you could call that like the good old days, you know, when it was like school colors. And I have to admit, I was orange and black all the way, but um, I didn't lose any friends over it, my problem, promise. 
Um, but I am part of the remnant of people that is still around. Are there any alumni in the room that you graduated from here and now you work here and you just never left? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably a lot of us. And I don't know about you, but like I walk around town and there are people that I see that I've literally been seeing for like the past 22 years of my life. And I don't know their name, but they're familiar. And I just want to say you're one of us too. Like you're the remnant. You came here for school. You never thought that you would stay, but here you are like two decades later. And now I say I'm going to die in Glendora. That is the trajectory of my life. Um, but you know, my first experience of Lent was actually here on APU's campus 20, exactly 20 years ago. Um, now growing up a good evangelical, um, I have to admit that my theology of Lent was pretty subpar at the time. I think I did confuse it a little bit with a holier, more righteous way to go on a diet, you know, lose a few pounds. Um, and I, I definitely wove like this spiritual component into it, so it just made it really righteous. Um, and so my first experience of Lent, my best friend and I, we decided that we were gonna give up all sweets for the entire 40 days. Has anybody ever given up sweets for Lent? <laughs> like we just went on a dessert fast, right? And I'm, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I'm, I can kind of be a letter of the law when I commit myself to do things. So I was very fastidious about not eating anything that I would consider a dessert, right? If it gave me that sense of satisfaction, I was going to stay away from it. Well, I'll never forget somewhere around week two into our fast, I went into a class that we both attended together, and it was a theology class. And I went to go sit down next to her, and I realized that she had something in her hand. And when I took a closer look, I realized that it was a red bag that said Skittles on it. And, and I looked at her a little bit dumbfounded, like, what, what's going on here? And I said, why are you eating Skittles? We're fasting from sweets. And in all honesty, I kid you not, without even skipping a beat, she said, it's more like fruit. And, and I have to admit, now again, keep in mind, my theology of Lent is a little bit not strong at the time, but even in the little bit that I knew, I felt like it was defeating the purpose. But in that moment, I have to admit, I really wanted some Skittles, right? So I thought, oh, can I rationalize this? But then I said, no, Skittles are not fruit. <laughs> you cannot <laughs> rationalize them as fruit fruit. But needless to say, she did not complete her 40 days of commitment to no sweets, but I did. I was very proud of that. But I've come to discover that there's just something about the Lenten experience that exposes the ways in which we have rationalized some of the things in our lives that might have a stronger grip on us than we care to admit, right? There's something about Lent that brings that to the surface. And it might not be as obvious as rationalizing Skittles as fruit, or some of us might say we just can't live without caffeine, and, and with four children and a five-month-old, I might be in that camp this morning. But what about the ways we abuse power, but we call it leadership? What about how we rationalize gossip, but we call it that we need to vent? Or how about self-preservation strategies and agendas, but we call it doing justice? We have a way of rationalizing things in our lives that have more power over us than we'd like to admit. But at some point, we have to be honest that Skittles aren't fruit, right? They are sugar coated in candy, hard sugar, infused with chemicals that make it taste like fruit flavors that really don't taste anything like the real thing. And if we were just being honest, we're just addicted to the way it makes us feel. That's 
what would come to the surface if we were being honest. Lent calls us to take an honest account, does it not? To admit what is really there, to admit what really has a grip on our lives. And this honest look, it calls us into repentance. It's what it is what it does. Because when we see that we are settling for anything less than the authority and the power of the cross, for anything less than our truest identity as children who are reconciled by Christ, our souls grieve. As Kevin mentioned, we mourn. Our souls grieve because power abuse grieves us when we see that the grace of the cross invites us into humility. Gossip grieves us when we see that the grace of the cross invites us to pursue peace. Giving ourselves over to fear grieves us when we see that the grace of the cross invites us to trust. It's this honest look that has a way of bringing the grief of our sin and the separation of shalom to the surface. But the beauty that we find in Ash Wednesday, which is why we are here this morning, is that there are two powerful stories, two very powerful realities unfolding in our lives at the same exact time. That while we recognize and wrestle with the consequences of our sin, when we turn toward Jesus on the cross, resurrection power takes root in us. Two very profound realities at the same time. This duality is perfectly put on display in the story of the men who hang on the cross near Jesus. I want you to listen for a moment to what it says in Luke chapter 23, verse 32. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Skipping down to verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So in this passage, we find that both men are offered forgiveness surely because of their proximity to Jesus. They are near to Jesus, but only one chooses to turn toward Jesus, to trust who Jesus says that Jesus is, and to see that Jesus is the only solution to his problem. Only one chooses to turn toward the grace that is being offered to him because of his proximity to Jesus. And it's in turning toward Jesus that he enters into this kingdom mystery that is the duality of life in the midst of death. He goes up on the cross, condemned a sinner with the outcome of death. But because he's next to Jesus, a new reality comes alive in him at the same exact time. And because he turns toward Jesus in one fail swoop of divine mercy, the trajectory of his sin changes course as he goes from death to life. At the same time, while he is dying, he is now being resurrected. He goes up condemned criminal, but he comes down reconciled as child. 
because this is what turning towards Jesus on the cross does every time. Though we are dying with Christ, we are being made alive in the same exact breath, a new identity, a new name. It's being resurrected in us at the same time. I've known Jesus most of my entire life, and the reality of this continues to take my breath away. I can't walk with Jesus long enough and this not come alive in me and take my breath away daily because it's a new day every day to experience the truth of this. Even as I was driving the other night, I was replaying a frustrating conversation that I had with one of my daughters in my mind in the car. And I was thinking, oh, what could I have done different? I wish I had done this different. I wish I was dif different. I wish I understood better how to nurture her, how to love her. And that veil and that script of shame just began to creep over me. But as it did, I just stopped the script from being written. And audibly, I called out to God, Jesus, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to know now? And in that moment, Shalom Peace said, don't be afraid. You're learning. She's learning. My grace covers that conversation. Because the cross that's made of ash, which we will wear on our foreheads a little bit later today, the cross made of ash that symbolizes these two realities mixing together, the ash that says that we grieve our bondage, but the cross that says that we celebrate our freedom, the cross made of ash says that while I hang on my cross of sin and shame, when I turn towards Jesus, something is being reconciled and restored in me at the same exact moment. I go up condemned as criminal, but I come down remembering that I am a child. It reminds me that as I die, I live. And by the grace of God, what dies in me is a cheap imitation, a false identity I have settled for and replaced for something that is real. That's what dies in me. I replace it for the real thing. When I turn towards Jesus, I hand over the bag of Skittles, and in return, I am given a bowl of the choicest, best fruit picked at the best time. I am given the sweet mangoes that melt in my mouth from the Philippines. I am given the tart mango steam from Thailand that I crave and I wish we could have them here. I am given the blackberries that I used to, to pick, the wild blackberries that grew around my grandparents' house in New Jersey. I am given the real thing when I, pick, when I hand over the cheap imitation and the false identity, turning towards the cross of Jesus offers us the truth, the real deal. It offers us our truest identity every time. In Lent, we come to acknowledge that there are some identities that we have just settled for. Again, we come to find that there are some things that just have far more power over us than we would like to admit. And for some of us, it could legitimately, legitimately be addict of chocolate and carbs and caffeine, right? But what about fearful? Is fearful an identity some of us have taken on? Is there anyone here today that is being lured by the power of fear? Does it have a grip on your life? How about angry? Is anyone angry today. Life's not going as you had planned. Systems, people perhaps are failing you and you're just taking on the identity of angry or apathetic. 
Some of us get so hardened with life, disappointed that we just decide that we're not going to care anymore. So we take on the identity of apathetic or how about defensive. You've given yourself over to the power of your own ability to justify or prove yourself, which has given way maybe to pride, maybe gossip. Is there any way, anybody who has taken on the identity of defensive? On this Ash Wednesday, I would ask you to consider what does the ash represent in you today? And how much power have you given it? Where is your soul grieved? Where do you mourn where you, where you see your identity as anything less than reconciled, restored, child of God? What is the name that you've attached to that needs to be exchanged? Where are you accepting criminal? I'm convinced that the greatest insult to Jesus is not our sin. It's not our poor choices. It's in the rejection of the grace that he offers us on the cross. That is the greatest insult to Jesus. And I believe that was the insult to Jesus from the two men who hung next to him that day. But as always, in every day, it's all, there's always good news, right? And the good news for you today is that the only place to begin in discovering your truest identity and the truth is turning toward Jesus on the cross. Here we come to find that the power of the cross overcomes the power of the ash every single time. As you draw near to Jesus, just as I did in the car that evening, shalom has the opportunity to infuse into the trajectory of your sin. Amen. Shalom infusing into the trajectory of our sin. What an amazing duality we are that we are invited into and drawing near to Jesus, resurrection power begins to win. It just has more authority. It takes over every single time. The old is gone, the new has come. And the most significant thing, again, that can happen to you in this very present moment, no matter how long you have walked with Jesus, no matter where you see yourself on the spectrum of faith, the most significant thing that can happen to you as you sit here this morning is that the joy of salvation emerges in you as the grace of Christ comes alive in you, transforms you, reconciles you. That's the most significant thing that could happen to us. So I pray that as we turn toward the cross today, that we receive the resurrection power at the same time, that we recognize that as we mourn our death, we will celebrate our life. That is our invitation. Will you pray with me? I am going to invite for the Holy Spirit to speak directly to you this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would alert our attention to any identity that we have attached to that is the false thing, that is not what is true. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would bring that one thing to the surface and for us to take a gentle look at those things. And that though it might cause grief in us to see that we have settled for something less, that we have settled for any cheap knockoff infused with cheap flavoring 
that is not real. That, God, the table is set for us today and each and every day to feast on the real thing. And I pray that the truth and the reality of that this morning would rise up in our souls. That as we take on the ash, we also take on the cross. And the cross is always more powerful. So God, give us willing spirits to yield, to trust, and to hope. In Jesus' name. As we receive God's word from his heart through his servant, we have opportunity to respond. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our service, we're going to be giving you opportunity to receive the imposition of ashes. As you receive these ashes, we pray that you will take an honest look Allow the Spirit to help you take an honest look at your own heart and not exchange the real thing for a replica. And that begins with reflection, confession, introspection. The Spirit will be faithful to guide you in that as you begin today traversing this Lenten season of self-examination but I also pray that you will lean into the into the duality of the gospel that comes with that of course that helps to tilt us toward Easter doesn't it in just a moment I'm going to invite um, Pastor Gaines and uh, Reverend Waters to help me, and we're going to position ourselves. Pastor Gaines will stand here, and I'll be over here, and Dr. Waters on my left, and we'd be happy to place ashes on your forehead. And some of you may be accustomed to this, and you know that as we do that, we will say some words to you that are designed to help you reflect and allow this moment to be a moment that begins your Lenten season of mourning, reflection, confession, sacrifice, so that the power of the gospel becomes all the more clear. Don't be afraid, and some of you, for some of you, this is the first time that you've been at a service like this, and the first time that you may wear ashes through the day. Don't be afraid of it. Um, it is an outward signal um, that you are on a journey some people, when they leave a service like this, they're a bit uncomfortable and they may take the ashes off. Others, I hope it will be you, will continue to wear these ashes through the day so that as you walk through the streets of Azusa or across the community, uh, you will identify other people who walk with Christ and who have so identified as well. Um, and there is a communion and a community that it finds unity in our common mourning and sacrifice that we may embrace the gospel of Jesus. So um, this is a wonderful moment. I hope that if it's new to you, that you will embrace it and the spirit will make it come alive for you. So uh, Dr. Waters, Abigail, if you would come.
into this day and the coming season of Lent. We invite you to show us our own deficiencies, our inadequacies, and to be accompanying us in the depths of our mourning as we realize our sin. And as we look toward Easter, I pray that the joy and the power of the gospel of Christ would become ever more deeply ingrained in our souls. May we embrace the true fruit that you offer us. Walk with us, protect us, bring us peace in our confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you as you go.